Um, then for the rest of it, I'm glad that it's only five hands. Uh, this is going to be at a very top, like a 20,000, 30,000 feet level. Uh, but we'll dig, dig deeper you know, in future series if there is sufficient interest. Because machine learning is basically a boring topic. And people who work on it know it's a lot of linear algebra and probability theory and all that. And if I really start going into this, we'll all be asleep in five minutes time. I'll, just to prevent that from happening, I've got a couple of videos. Um, so and these are some of these are like amazing ones. And one I'm particularly like. Right? Um, I'll show it to you, and then you will realize what it is. So before I jump in and start uh, think, talking about, okay, this is a provocative, uh, you know, uh, topic headline. Can machines really learn? Um, so what do you think is the answer? Yes. 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 Super. Okay. All right. Yes, yes. And all are correct answers. Somebody says no, that's also a correct answer. So um, the uh, machines can learn, but they learn very differently than the way humans learn. Right? And you will ask, as we progress through the slides and the videos and all that, you'll get a slightly better understanding of what I'm trying to say. Um, machines can learn things that human beings cannot learn. Wow, that's what. What does that mean? Um, let me see. <clears throat> if you have hundred rows of data, you can just view it in a spreadsheet. If you've got thousand to ten thousand rows of data, you can subject it to some graphs and charts and all that, and look at the trends. What happens if you have a million or a billion rows of data? What are you going to do? Can you like take it and then turn it into some format in which you can easily consume it? It's not easy. So. Here is where we want somebody to come and do this work on behalf of us, and who is better to do that than the machine? Okay? It's not a new area. It's uh, there's been research going on for a long period of time. There are lots. There's a lot of overlapping terminology, and you know, there's a big alphabet soup that is associated with it. So I'll I'll step through some of those kinds of things. Okay? So. The title, once we get past this slide, I'm not going to talk about can machines learn at all, because the answer is yes or no, and session is over, we can all leave. Right? But it's not that simple. What I want to talk about is what really happens. Okay. So I went around Google. I have like about 25 definitions of machine learning. The, I think the, it's not in a particular order. Uh, some of the people I like, sent the uh, you know, presentation to didn't even like the first one. But machine learning is getting computers to program themselves. They'll say, what the hell is that? I mean, even human beings cannot program properly. How can machines program themselves? So it has a specific context, and, and I'll explain what it is. The second one is slightly better. Learning from examples and the experience. So examples, they give you a lot of examples to the machine, and it can derive some patterns from it, and it learns. And then as you give more and more examples, the experience gets better and the machines learn better. So in any machine learning project, for the people who are working in it, you will already know, the initial results will be very pathetic. So and that, which is also the problem that a lot of people have, is that accuracy rates are very, very low. Because you know you need large amounts of data of doing it. And this video that I'm going to show you will bring that fact in, to the front. Machine learning give, gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. This is exactly what we want. There are class of problems human beings can solve. As long as we can make it like a stepwise, like you know, step one, step two, step three, or set of rules, all those kinds of things, we can do very easily because we can comprehend what it is. When we are thrown billions of rows of data, we just look at it and say, ah, I have no idea how to program it. I know this is the input, I want this is the output, but I have no absolutely no idea how to go from input to output. And that is where it is. Uh, okay, so my standard joke, uh, sorry if you are in my previous session, I'm repeating it. All the good slides in this presentation are stolen. All the bad ones were made by me. You can figure out which ones uh, very quickly there. This is a list of um, really nice uh, resources. In fact, uh, some one of my friends was joking, there's a curated list of data science and machine learning um, resources. And that itself is really, really large. You want the lights off? Yeah. Can you? 
Is that better? Okay. All right. So I'll, you know, any of you who are interested, you can send me an email. Um, I'll send you these slides. Um, I, it's also, I think, on Google Drive. When I can share the um, slides in there. So first start with some terminology. So you hear the term data science, artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, <coughs> machine learning, lots and lots of things. Then we don't even get into subfields like uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforced, lots and lots of terms. So first time you come and say, Bakre, what is all this stuff? And what, is, what is the difference between this and that? What is data mining? And you know, what is statistical learning? <laughs> What is probability theory? All that stuff, right? So some kind soul, I mean, I have a couple of these Venn diagrams, uh, put together all this stuff. Machine learning is considered as a subfield of artificial intelligence. In fact, somebody recently mentioned that ML is AI, that machine learning is AI. So you'll get all these terms. You say the term artificial intelligence is a problem. And I generally am very reluctant to use it. But now everybody says ML is AI, so maybe I'll use AI here and there. Because the reason why I don't like the term is it sets up very high expectations. Artificial intelligence has to be as intelligent as human beings, I and mean, it's not. It's much dumber. But it's super intelligent in certain areas. Um, and so uh, generally we'll avoid, uh, I'll try to stick to machine learning. So, But machine learning and data science, what is the similarity, what is the difference, all the kind of stuff. So if you really look at it, uh, artificial intelligence is the big umbrella term. Machine learning is a sub-field of artificial intelligence. Deep learning is a sub-sub-field of uh, machine learning. And deep learning, you might have heard about TensorFlow, Google, AlphaGo, uh, all the deep mind and all these kinds of things. And I, I talk, it's based on neural networks, which uh, again is a controversial topic. Uh, it's been around for about a few decades. Right? And data science is using all these machine learning algorithms and also working with data, bringing in clean data so that machines can work with them. So there's the data engineering aspect of it. So the best way to find out is if you go and look for jobs in data science and you look at all the terms, you'll find several different things. You know, we'll, we'll use the term modeling quite a bit. Again, again so you create machine learning creates a model that can be used, and I'll explain you know, what it is. This is another one. So, so there's a term we forgot called big data. So big data itself is another huge um, black hole. Um, it is defined by what is called three Vs initially. It's called velocity, veracity, and volume. So when, when we think of big data, because the term says big, we always think of large amount of data. But big data need not necessarily be large amount of data. Then of course somebody kept on digging deeper and deeper and deeper and then we, are, we love acronyms and we love all these inventions and stuff like that. Now it's got seven Vs, and I don't even remember most of them. Okay. But think about velocity. Velocity is the speed with which data comes. You need to handle it. So real-time stuff that is happening. And like for example, if you look at signals, like if you have a robotic uh, uh, surgery uh, and you have a tool that does it, the data has to be like faster than the human beings can make this. So there is the speed with which data comes and the amount of data that comes. Uh, so volume is one, but speed is another one. The complexity of data, the different varieties, different formats of data. <laughs> so if you're doing conventional IT, you know the rows and columns, spreadsheets, databases, we are all familiar with that. But what about text? What about analysis of sentiment in the large amount of text that is coming through Twitter feeds, Facebook posts, and things like that, and that is textual data? How do you understand that? What about image data? Large amounts of images are coming from Mars rover. You need to interpret that, right? Large amount of, uh, you want to see a spying on people, and large amount of audio data is coming. And when, where are the tools for taking all these things and getting it? So you take big data, you take AI, you take data science. These are all big groups. And machine learning is somewhere in the intersection. I don't know if it's correctly positioned or not. I'll take the diagram because it is complicated. OK, but this is, these are the, they're all interrelated fields. Um, this is a slight variation of the previous one. AI, deep learning is the innermost child. And I'll tell you a little bit about deep learning. Example, uh, you know, then you have, you know, there are all these examples, representation learning, machine learning, and then AI. So I just like I've beaten it to death. 
the three diagrams. So we'll uh, we'll move on now that you got the big picture. So let me deep learning is built using neural networks, and uh, there's a huge history of this. This this field went up and down. It was in favor for some time. It failed and in favor sometimes. This this story of automation intelligence. Uh, it started in mid 50s, if you, and they are what called AI winters. That is, when if you say that you're working in AI, you won't get a job. You can't even publish a paper saying AI in the title, it won't get accepted in conferences. We went through that phase, and now it is like upswing again. So it's one of those cycles. But what has happened is in each one of these cases, something dramatic has come and changed the picture. And the, the big factor that is changing the picture is the huge amount of data that we have. So that we can actually make the data-based decisions. And that is what is saving almost all these um, technologies. Okay, <clears throat> so let us start with one video. Um, can we switch? Okay, I can. I can. Peter Norvig. Peter Norvig is, um, is, is amazing. He was a director of search at Google. Um, I don't know what he does right now, but he was in NASA before that. He's a professor in Stanford. He wrote the most authoritative book on artificial intelligence, three volumes, I mean like one volume, three editions, and I think the fourth one is about to come out. Um, I like him because he wears cool shirts. Um, but he, is, he demystifies technology you know, unbelievably well. And he, and he makes it so casual. All these first 10 minutes was the introduction. I have a link to this video. I'm not going to play it completely. I'm going to play about maybe 10, 15 minutes of it. And then I want you to take it. Uh, I'll give you the link to watch the whole video. Because they talk about how Google does language translation. Uh, how does it take a sentence in English and convert it to Spanish, for example. And they step you through the examples that are so clear. It's just unbelievable. So it's, uh, so let's start. <coughs> so competition. And many researchers kind of drop it from this. Please join me welcoming Peter Norton. Stefan and then everyone at the university for inviting me. Thank all of you for showing up and struggling through sitting in the aisles or standing on the sides or whatever and I hope we can all have some fun. Uh, but I like to think that he would have been a computer scientist if only such a field had existed and if only there had been computers in the 1930s. So what did he do that deserved the title of computer scientist? One thing that Gödel did is he made a connection between the real world and the world of mathematics. So say in the real world, you notice uh, Anna is taller than Berta. You can write that in mathematics. And then another day, you notice uh, Berta is taller than Carla. And you can write that in mathematics. And if you're only observing the world, you kind of be stuck. What else could you do just by looking at the world? But if you have mathematics, then you could put those two facts together. You could do a valid logical inference, and you could come up with a new fact. And then the amazing thing that, that Gödel really laid out is you can take that fact, and now you can project it down into the real world, and you can say, Anna is taller than Carla, without ever having observed that in the real world. So what Gödel did is he took this language of mathematics and he talked about this process 
of coming up with a proof. You take true facts in, and true facts come out, and you can do something useful in the real world through this process of proof. And up to Google, that process of proof had just been mathematicians kind of waving their hands. And, and when they came up with something that most people agreed to, they said, now we're done. We have, we have a proof. But what Google did was said, I'm not, I don't want to just be swayed by rhetoric. I want to be absolutely sure. So he laid out a completely formal way of specifying that proof. And we did it with mathematicians then, and we called them proofs. But today, we have computer programmers, and we call them programs. And it's this very formal. There's no hand-waving in computer programs. It's got to be precise. And Google really laid the foundation for that. Uh, so that's great, and we can do a lot with programs. There's lots of problems we can solve and things we can do in the world. But there's some problems that we can't really solve, where the programmer is stuck, where they're faced with a problem that they don't know what to do with. So let's go back to the real world and think of a typical day for Anna. Uh, she speaks into her phone, says some words, and the phone recognizes her speech and does the right thing and say she tells the phone, I want to listen to some music, and it starts playing songs, and it learns her preferences, and it plays the kind of music she wants. Let's say she goes into a supermarket, and the stock that's on the shelf, some computer system has learned what everybody in that neighborhood wants to buy, and they stock the right stuff. She pays with a credit card, and uh, the credit card company has figured out, is this uh, transaction a valid? Is it fraudulent? Should I accept it or deny it? She uh, posts a picture to a social networking site, and the faces of her friends are all recognized and tagged. And maybe she wants to plan a trip, and she asks for the most efficient route, and a website directs her exactly there. So she does all these things without thinking about it, but every single one of them has this property that the programmer wouldn't necessarily know how to do it. So I, as a programmer, you know, I can solve a lot of problems, but I don't know how to recognize speech or recognize somebody's face and say, this face belongs with this name and, and this face belongs with another name. I can't write down the steps to do that. Uh, and so I'm stuck. I couldn't solve that problem. So what do we do when the programmer can't come up with a solution? And the answer is, computer can come up with a solution. If we as programmers can't do it, we can tell the computer to do it. And so what we do is we have, instead of having the programmers like lots of little programs, we have one big program that we call machine learning, artificial intelligence, got different names, and there isn't necessarily just one of them, but there's variations of them. And then we feed it some examples, and then the output of that program, rather than doing something, is it produces a new program. So it learns to write that program that we as programmers aren't smart enough to do. And in the rest of this lecture, I'm going to show you some examples of what we can do with that. So for example, making sense of word sentences. What do I mean by that? Here's some example sentences. There's the word bank. And there's two sentences of the word bank. There's the one having to do with money and the one having to do with the river. And one aspect of understanding language is you should probably know the difference between those two. We'd like to understand everything about those sentences, but I'm going to break it down and just solve that one little subpart of understanding language. And how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to feed some data uh, into a program, and it's going to learn to write the program that will do that recognition. Because I don't know how to do it as a programmer. I don't know how to write the rules to do that. But I can gather up these examples. I can go search the web, find a million sentences that have the word bank in it, and throw that in. And then I can go to my dictionary and say, here's two definitions. And I can throw that in. And now I'm going to ask the computer, take those two things, list the sentences, list the definitions, and write me a program that will distinguish. And now I can feed it a new sentence, and it will say, this is bank one, or this is bank two. Now I'm going to tell you how to do that. So this is what it looks like. The sentences and dictionary definitions come in. You feed it into machine learning. And the program that decides the word sense comes out. And now I can take that program and I can give it a new sentence it's never seen before. I put my money in the bank. And 
to create a brand new, uh, or create the, the output. Uh, I know which sense that is. So how do I do it? Well, I start with these definitions, because that's all I got to begin with. I got these definitions, and I take out my scissors, and I cut up the definitions into individual words, and I take each individual word and put it into a bag. Now, this is a very formal mathematical model that has a technical name. It's called the bag of words model. So we got that bag, it's got some words in it, we shake the bag up. We do the same thing with, with number two. We take all the words, we throw it into there. And so now we got these two bags. One's got those words in it, and this other bag has got these words in it. And now we're going to say, I need a model of how language works. So there's lots of tricky things going on in those sentences. They're talking about actions that are happening, they're referring to lots of words. It seems like I need to understand something about how language works in order to answer this question. And so I need a model of how language works. And I'm going to start off with the stupidest possible model I can think of. And one of my heroes, George Fox, the statistician, said essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we shouldn't mind that the model is wrong. And so my model of language is when you want to create a sentence, you pick out a bag that corresponds kind of to the kind of thing you want to say. And then you reach into that bag and you pull out a bunch of words and you put them together. And that's how people make sentences. Now, I know that model is completely wrong, but we'll see that it turns out to be useful. So I've got these two bags, and now a sentence comes in, and I want to say, who made this sentence? Was this sentence most likely generated by pulling, bag, pulling words out of bag one, or by pulling uh, words out of bag two? And we see, well, there's only one overlap. There's uh, one word in there that comes from bag two. So probably it's more likely that this sentence came from bag two. So I could label it as that, and I would get this one right. But more importantly than getting this one right, I can now update my model and make it better. So I can take all the words from this sentence and throw them into bag two. So bag two is now bigger. I keep on doing that, and the bags get bigger and bigger, and they've got bigger counts for the number of words they've seen. They've got a larger vocabulary corresponding to each word. So each bag is becoming a better model of making sentences about bank two or making sentences about bank one. And basically, that's all there is to it. Everything I need to know, I learned from Stephanie Street. You call him the count. You call him drop all, right? right? So here he is making a determination that this is sense number one for this word. OK, so we've done that. We just feed a bunch of sentences through. We keep on making the bag bigger and bigger. And now we've got this program, this word sense decider program. I can give it any new sentence that can tell me, is this bank one or bank two? And I can apply it to these sentences. Uh, and it does a good job. So let's measure how well does it do. And the answer is it depends on how well you train it. Uh, so if you give it 1 million words of training data, I go out on the web, I find a million words of sentences that have the word bank in it. And you know, remember I said there was one yellow box called machine learning. Actually, I lied. And there's different schools of machine learning that prefer different techniques. And they publish papers that argue about whose technique is better. And one of the papers uh, described four different techniques. And they got these funny names. Uh, they're all different methods of machine learning. We don't need to go into the detail. And said, which one performs better? So when you give them one million words of sentences involving the word bank or whatever other word you want to uh, decide about, uh, this is the performance. The best one, the blue one here, does 85% and the others are 80 something percent. So you might be tempted to say, yeah, well, the guys who are voting for blue, they're winning. Uh, but don't, don't uh, stop the discussion yet. Instead, we can go out and find 10 million words to train any data, train it, and, and work, try again. And now everybody's doing better. In fact, uh, everybody's doing better than any of the ones with one million. So all these people that were arguing about is my technique better than your technique and, and who has a tricky new idea, having a tricky idea isn't as good as just going out and gathering more data. And you can keep doing that. You get 100 million words. It's better still. And now three out of the four were better than the best before. And when you get out to a billion words of training data, Seems like it's starting to uh, 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 pass and throw it out. We're not going to get too much more improvement. 
But now we're up to uh, 97%, correct. And we didn't know anything to start with. We had a terrible model of English. We didn't know anything about the syntax of English. We didn't know anything about the meanings of any of the words. We just had these two bags, and now we can solve this problem at 97%. And it turns out that a lot of problems have this type of uh, characteristic response, that if you feed in a little bit of data to a very simple algorithm, it performs terribly. But if you get out into the millions and billions of examples, it starts to perform well. And you could say that, that Google makes its living by trying to find problems that have this kind of shape and, and then trying to find the billions of examples that go with it and then doing very well. OK, so deciding between river bank and money bank, maybe that's not so impressive. Let's try to do something hard. Let's try to translate between languages. So uh, translate between uh, German and English or whatever. Uh, This is such a fabulous, uh, know about language translation materials much better than I can ever explain. Uh, but I want to take back control, so uh, I'm stopping it here. But you got a taste, right? So you start with something with no, so for a long time I used to think that to understand language, you need to be able to parse it, you need to understand the subject predicate object, you need to look at you know, if there's multiple sentences, you need to take the pronouns and map them to the proper nouns, and you know, you need, there's like a whole bunch of things. There is a toolkit in Python called NLTK, which is Natural Language uh, Toolkit, which helps you do this. And the way, if you think about language for a minute, um, let's say, uh, take a simple sentence in English like Rama, kill Ravana, right? You know, subject, predicate, object. In Tamil, it is Raman, Ravane Kona, right? Which is very different. In Telugu, also, there will be a similar one, right? The mapping is different, so you need to find the mappings. So, original language translations used to create a semantic structure from one language and map the semantic structure to the other language. And they've been reasonably successful, but not very successful. Then they come up with this model where they throw a billion words at you. And the way Google, Google Translator is probably one of the better ones. There are some that are, uh, you know, I think Microsoft has, has got a good model too. The way they work is very simple. You know how Google did it? They, and he, he would describe in the rest of the video, but I'll shorten it for you, is what they did was for every book that existed in language X, let's say English, they found the translation of the book in Chinese, for example. Then they fed the machine all this data, just like this like hundreds of thousands of books and hundreds of thousands of the equivalent books in the other language. Then they started looking at the patterns, basically the co-occurrence patterns. Like when you use a certain word, you see you will co-occur along with other words, for example. So you start, it's, it's, it's a very interesting exercise. And then they came up with what could not be solved before uh, is being solved better and better and better. Like you see, it said there, no? Every time you get a new sentence and you mark it as bank one or bank two, then you take all the new words in that sentence and add it to this bag of words. Right? So you start off with some basic stuff, maybe like 10, 12 sentences. <coughs> then you increase the number of sentences, you keep on increasing it. The class is a simple binary classification if you really look at it. So they could go here or go there and then keep on doing it again and again and again and again. And that's how Google does it. Right? And um, I had a session on chatbots last month, and this is one of the things we want to recognize. We want to recognize when somebody types saying, hey, I want a book of flight to Bangalore, I want to recognize the intent that I want to travel. And uh, it's a flight, so I want to fly. And destination, Bangalore. And I assume the source is Chennai because I'm typing it in Chennai, right? So this intent, this and all the attributes of the intent you need to do, one, Machine learning or artificial intelligence is one of the ways in which you can learn. Okay, next. Next. Oh. Okay. Um, I'll skip the friendly intro because watching too many videos may have kind of movie kind of effect and we may all fall asleep. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there are different types of machine learning. I'm just dealing with a couple of them, the more popular ones. 
One is called supervised learning. Don't try to read the text. I mean, I just put it so that you know it reminds me and I need to cover all this kind of stuff. It's what is called supervised learning. You build, it's a very simple super, uh, very simple model. What you do is you give it, give the machine some data, and you label the data. And the most popular example in supervised learning is what is called spam detection. So you get an email, you say it's spam. You get an email, it's not spam. And initially, if you remember correctly, Google is probably the most successful uh, spam detection because compared to Hotmail, Google was doing much better at spam. So I switched from Hotmail to uh, or Yahoo to Google. Gmail, because they, you know what they were doing originally? They will ask you to mark an email as spam. That is, they were gathering data from you. They give away the email free to everybody. They take these emails, and then you mark it as spam. You are labeling it. So, or if you don't mark it as spam, it's not spam. And they get this data from millions of users. So they have all this information. Then they'll find out what are the common patterns in spam email, for example. Uh, if you go to WordPress, they find comment spam. And they have a simple rule that if any email contains more than three links, this pause is probably comment spam kind of stuff. So these rules are automatically found from the data itself. So in this case, what happens is label is spam or not spam. The data is actually the email uh, from which it is coming, some IP address. You know, because if you go to the detailed email header, you will see all these kinds of things. The subject line, if it contains bank and Nigeria and you know, offer and fantastic and all, we know this things, right? So uh, subject line, and then actually the text in the thing also, because the spammers get smarter. When they say the subject line is being detected, they change the subject line because they, you know, completely differently, and then so you need to shift to something else. So they go deeper and deeper. But this is, uh, and I'll give you another example of supervised learning. We, so I have a product that I built about in 2002. So it's still selling, you know, like I don't do any marketing, no sales, I think there's a website. People come and buy it, and then it's, a, it's not a large, like a, you know, money maker, but it gives continuous revenues, no marketing, no sales, no support. All the developers have left. Fortunately, the developer who built it, built it so solid that it just stays there. And once in like two or three months, I have to reboot the server. Mm -hmm. I think one of the JDBC drivers or something has a leak, not in the software. So I wanted to see a pattern of, we give a free trial to people, 30 days free trial. They come and use the product. Then some of them convert. They subscribe, uh, they pay. And my oldest customer is a customer who used the product in beta, continues to still still use it. And um, so I wanted to find out what is the characteristics of these people who come that actually convert. So it's not a problem only for my product. It's a problem for anybody who Googles any product. So when 100,000 users sign up for yours, you know, in the case of maybe Freshdesk or you know, um, how do you know which ones to focus on? Right? You want to go and sell to them and push them a little bit, and if they are running into some problems in trial, you know, help them solve the problems and that kind of stuff. So we did a very small experiment. I got one one of my programmers to just write a small machine learning pro program. So I looked at the characteristics of the user. I said I had some theories, of course, and of course. There are. Um, my theory was that if the guy puts a corporate email address, he's more likely to be a serious buyer compared to the guy who puts a Gmail address or a Hotmail address. Okay, I was completely wrong, and I'll tell you why. Um, then we have a bunch of optional fields that people can type in, like the title of the uh, their title, you know, their job function, why they're trying to use the product. None of us fill up any of those kinds of things. But whatever little data I have, I wanted to take it and then look at it. So essentially what I created, I created a spreadsheet of a few thousands of this data. I knew exactly, I know what my conversion factor is. My conversion is about 13%, which is pretty good. And I said, why do these people buy and why don't others buy? What are the characters? So when a new person comes in, can I predict that this person is likely buyer? What is the person, to, you know, what is the uh, you know, probability of this person buying? So we did a small experiment uh, for finding it out. And this is actually supervised learning. I gave it data. I said this person actually converted. This person didn't convert. The historical data. 
whenever new data comes in, I can find out. The interesting part is, I don't have to, if I know that the probability is above 60%, I don't care about it. I will buy anyway. If the probability is below 30%, I'm not going to waste my time with him, because converting him is hard work. So the other middle 40% are the guys that I want to focus on to push them up uh, and see whether I can succeed. And this is actually a tool for sales and marketing. And what we are using is machine learning. Of course, my model, uh, you know, the amount of data that I have is not that large. But still, we got some reasonably good um, predictions, you know, like 78% uh, accuracy kind of predictions. It's a very small amount of data. I'm just imagining, like, if Peter Normally, if you can get like billions of rows of data, how interesting it will be. Kind of stuff. So, which is not, nothing to do with machine learning. The corollary of this is that just give it away free and watch the behavior. And you, you learn so much from people, and you don't necessarily have to dig through the data to find out. So, that is supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is same data without the labels. Okay? You don't have the labels. So you get like uh, a typical example of unsupervised learning is you get you are getting all these new art articles of news. You want to classify them, uh, cluster them as you know sports news, tech news, business news, blah. There will be some overlapping sections kind of stuff, and this is typically unsupervised learning because nobody has tagged them before, and probably you could use something like this bag of words model and you could convert it, or you can start with some initial. There is another one which is like a mixture of. So you have some tags that is some labels, and a lot of data does not have labels, and then you can you can use that. So that is unsupervised learning, and then we'll talk about um, uh, some of the applications. Semi-supervised learning is the mixture of the model. Partly I have few few labels, and I don't have a uh, lot. So let us look at uh, machine learning applications. Okay, so. Spam detection, we already talked about it, and that is the example every book will give you, because it's the easiest to understand. Credit card fraud detection, actually PayPal uses machine learning for credit card. In fact, they talk about the challenges they face in real time stopping the transaction. And they have like, you know, very small amount of time from the time you put in the credit card data, at a bunch of source, where are you putting it from, in which machine, where is it coming from, what is the amount, what is the purchase, all that kind of stuff. I happened to talk to a data scientist at uh, a paper once, and uh, like there are a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting types of frauds that, that happen. And they have to stop this fraud in real time with the data that they have. I mean, lots of times the users are entirely new. If somebody steals your credit card, that person is not likely to have a past behavior, but they have the, you have the past behavior of the credit card, for example. So this is, you know, uh, so there are applications that have been happening for a long time, but they're getting better and better. Uh, <coughs> credit risk assessment. This is uh, banks use a lot, saying that, hey, if I give you an X amount, uh, are you likely to repay uh, properly or not, and based on a variety of factors, Initially, it's a set of rules saying what is your income level, what is your past, past credit history, and all that sort of stuff. But you know, you can get refined more and more uh, over a period of time. Digit recognition. I mean, postal services have been using it for, for ages. Handwritten digits, find out which, which one it is. It's also one of the first exercises in deep learning um, that you can see. Uh, speech understanding is one of the most difficult things to do. Speech understanding had two issues. One is Converting speech to text, and then and inferring what those words mean, and that is where I think large volume of data is very useful. I think recently uh, Mozilla Foundation has made large corpora of uh, voice available for people to go and experiment, um, so that you can write your own algorithms. Speech recognition has been like kind of like OCR for a while, has been like you know dancing around in some low percentage uh, conversion rates for a long time. And all of a sudden, in the last five years, now they have jumped to like 98% or 99%. Beidou, which is a Chinese corporation, uh, has uh, supposedly one of the highest. I was trying out a whole bunch of things in Samsung, uh, you know, S8, a uh, new phone. Speech um, is damn good. And the one, Alexa, they're from Amazon, uh, is, is amazing at recognizing speech. I haven't seen it so far falter on literally anything with all our accents and stuff like that. It's really, really good because they've been gathering 
huge. I mean, I think they sold 9 million units last year, and then every day they get lots and lots of information. You will find one nice, interesting pattern. In almost all these systems that recognize speech, the, you will find that they are all cloud-based services. They, all the data actually goes to the cloud, so that one, one central system can take this large amount of data and make sense of it. There. Okay, there is object detection, which uh, you, you might have seen that uh, all these photos, Facebook recognizes the faces of your friends. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't do a good job with me. It always confuses me for my brother. It always comes and tells me that I should tag my brother in my photograph. We don't even look that close, but anyway. Um, but object recognition, like uh, automatic captioning system, if you see that, you'll be amazed. You put a picture and it'll come and tell you this is an airport with several planes and some people in the foreground. This green grass, it's two ducks like floating around in the pond nearby, lots of trees here. This is this automatic captioning is being done by programs, actually by machines. So um, that's very important, right? Like when you look at Google, when uh, Google Streets project was going on, what Google did was they had a van <coughs> with a bunch of cameras in the van and they would drive through the streets till I think somewhere in Europe they were stopped and said don't do it anymore. So they would go there and they'll look at, take pictures of the buildings, and they'll rip apart all the little pieces and they'll tell you this is an apartment complex and they'll say the third floor there's a business because there's a little board in there kind of thing. So that level. So they, they'll take the object, decompose the objects, they break it down, they recognize which objects and they'll do this. Now I think there is AR, you know, which is a topic that we should talk about at some point called augmented reality. You look at things and I can show the short temple of Mahabalapuram, it can come back and give you all the details. So recognizing background, the objects, that is big thing. This is very important for uh, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars have to do it at a tons of more complex problems, right? And there are courses on, you know, the software that runs on self-driving cars and it's really, really fascinating. It, you know, what is its biggest challenge? Its biggest challenge is finding out whether something uh, on the road is a trash can, I mean trash bag, or some solid object. They still haven't gotten to that kind of stuff, but there's a whole bunch of self-driving cars and I just happened to, a friend of mine um, had a Tesla and we were driving on Autobahn and he said, I have no price. We are driving 550 kilometers that day to uh, give a talk in Berlin from Frankfurt. And he said, I said, why do you want to drive? I said, let's just take a train or fly. You can read a book. He said, no, no, with Tesla, there is no tension. He wanted to show off this, this thing. And, and I said, what do you mean, no tension? Driving is driving. And in 220 to 240 kilometers drive speed, it make you go crazy. Um, he said, you know what? I can do hands off. He said, I'm going to show it to you. I said, please don't. And he said, please took your hands off. And it was going, it was following the road, curves, the cars. Then he finally he, he, he grabbed the wheel and when we slowed down, I said, why did you grab it? He said, it can automatically do this. He said, no, no, there's a problem. There is one car in front. So if there is an object in front, it latches onto the object. And that car was cutting into the next lane between two trucks. And this one was almost like slightly going in the direction. Then it saw a huge, uh, you know, track there, and then stopped and came back in here. So it still has some refinement to be done with the software kind of stuff. But this is this is actually happening. This is happening in cars. Of course, it will be a nice challenge to bring one of those cars and put in Chennai <laughs> because some of the objects that jump in front of you can't even detect them. <laughs> Yeah. We have one question from Facebook. So one of uh, Mr. Pradeep says, how far are we from having driverless, driverless cars in India, according to you? Yeah, I'm not going to take a guess on that. <laughs> so, uh, but they change behavior, right? They're not actually uh, running around anywhere even in the US. Uh, they tried an experiment, I think Uber tried an experiment in San Francisco, limited, they got a permission to do an experiment. Even in Google driverless cars, uh, there is a driver, okay? I mean, well, he's not a driver, he's sitting there reading a novel or something like that. But the uh, law requires that it will freak out people if a car is going around with nobody inside, right? It will cause a lot of accidents, not by the car, but the people who look at the car. So that is that is not going to um, happen, but I think there are lots of interesting uh, side effects of this. Is that it can reduce uh, fatigue. If you have a driver in a car, it can take care of simple things like speed, you know, they can, they are at a very, uh, very advanced stage of 
object detection and the automatic braking. So it's a whole bunch of technologies interleaved together for doing it. And just looking at this, they're all machine learning. So previously, the joke was that car is uh, a big piece of metal, a huge engine carrying a big piece of metal. Now the joke is that the car is an engine carrying about 56 microprocessors. Uh, kind of thing. So some of the models of BMW have more than 70 or 80 uh, microprocessors all talking to each other. Kind of thing. So object detection, of course, web search. You know, Google is con con continuously refining the web search because everybody is trying to beat it so that they can come into the front page and Google is trying to beat them so that they can't and it's like a war going on all the time. Uh, but a lot of machine learning is being used. Information extraction, which has been one of the core fields for a long period of time. Uh, social networks is that who sees your posts depends on a variety of factors, not just people who like your posts. There's a whole bunch of interesting things. People who like your posts, who share your posts, who have influence about a lot of people. So you need to map the social network and you know, some part of it is mechanical, uh, meaning in the sense that it doesn't require machine learning. Some parts of it are uh, very interesting. Uh, disease diagnosis. IBM Watson is doing it. They can, they, they are now claiming about 250 different types of diseases they can recognize. I mean, they don't let, IBM Watson let loose on some patient, you know, I'd be scared to death. Uh, but what they do is they make suggestions to doctors and doctors look at these things and then they say, okay, fine, you know, um, these are the suggestions. And they are, I think the uh, MRI scans, the radiology, these are all the areas where machine learning is playing an active role. Uh, kind of these are just a very small set of uh, sample applications. Um, this is from Wikipedia. I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to step through this. You can do it. You can go and find out. It's like literally, um, you know, in every, every area. There are some surprising applications of machine learning, and then I'll play the other video for you. Um, see, you can't read it, so I'll let me do this here. Um, to recognize the user of a mobile device, okay, so you look at a mobile device. Okay? They can find out whether the user is sitting down, standing, lying down, walking, jogging, or jumping up and down, probably on a dance floor, or jumping up and down in frustration about something else. So, or in a car, for example. How do you know that? All you do is the accelerometer, the GPS. Just get these two things, and you can immediately start thinking about it. So now you just think about it. Just with a little bit of data, what are the, some dude knows that I'm standing here in Purina, but my phone is right there, so he must be thinking that I'm sitting there. But people can inform what you are doing without you ever telling them uh, what you're doing, right? So even before this, there was uh, this cool application um, that uh, uh, that are there. In Max, they have these vibration sensors, the accelerometers, and then what happens if 10,000 of them vibrate simultaneously at the same, roughly at the same rate in one region? means that's an earthquake detection. So there are some really, really interesting applications of these kinds of things. I'm sorry that I put this here because even I can't read it, maybe because of the bright lights. Um, but there are some, uh, can we turn off? And because some of these are really funny. Um, so you can predict whether you're a psychopath based on your course. <laughs> I think that would be really, uh, really useful. Um, the auction sale phase of some heavy equipment, that's a very specialized application. Uh, uh, there remain a car bought at, uh, okay, this is, this is a real. Did you buy a car at an auction and is it a lemon? That can be detected by using machine learning technologies. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the slides so you can take a look at it. And some of them are really, really important. And some of them are completely off the charts in terms of types of applications. Okay. So, how much time do you have? Half an hour. So I, I'm going to pause and take some questions, but let me do two slides and then we'll pause, take questions, and then I can go back to the other. So whenever there's a technology that's being hyped a lot, right? You know, everybody says machine learning, everybody says AI, everybody says you know chatbots and all that stuff. How do you know it is hype or it is real? So. The best way to find out, according to me, is that find out who is hiring these dudes, right? So go and do some job searches. And normally, I look at the uh, trends of 
large companies, I mean, because they are the early adopters, but they are doing a lot of research, then, you know, and they are hiring a lot of people in the space, then it's a good one kind of thing. But the next level, if a lot of people are hiring, then that may be a good trend too. So what I did was, I went to Google Trends. And Google Trends is not really a job trend. Basically, people are typing machine learning because they're trying to locate uh, information about machine learning so that they can learn. That means it's an early phase. And Google Trends is, has been like the last four or five years since 2012, like five years. And, and you can see some dips and that, some, that kind of stuff. You can see. So this is one, one indicator. The other indicator is, to me, this is more interesting is there's a site called Indeed.com. There are a couple of others, Stack Overflow, Glassdoor, and all these kinds of things. And you look at the jobs, um, demand for jobs. I just, I mean, this is a very rough one. I didn't even add terms like associated terms like data science. To truly get the picture, you need to add all the adjacencies to machine learning, machine learning applications, applied machine learning, data science and AI and all that, and you'll get a much better graph. But I just too lazy, just time machine learning and got this graph a couple of days ago, and, and um, you can see this consistently going on. So that means there is a demand. Okay. Again, off topic, how do you know that, okay, there's all this demand. How do you know that demand is not being supplied? So if you, are, you want to go off and let's say that you want to supply machine learning engineers to the rest of the world, which a lot of us probably do, uh, should I invest because there is a training period of about at least three to six months before they can even get some really, really simple applications up? The, you go and watch the dates on these uh, jobs. The job, and you can sort them by the number of days on which the job has been sitting there without being filled, and that's a good indicator of what is the demand versus supply. If there's a huge amount of supply, job will come and vanish. Whereas if there is a you know huge uh, supply problem, and then you know the job will stay there for a long period of time. So that's one. Uh, you can also try it. You can go to Indeed. Uh, unfortunately, the job trends is not given by Indeed India. Uh, they do it only for this thing. But Indeed India, you can go and type the jobs. One more test that I normally do is I look at high-paying jobs in the U.S. And that's normally a leading trend. Any jobs that pay between hundred thousand dollars to two hundred thousand dollars. I look at those jobs and find out what are all the technologies they use, and then you can just go and take a look at them and see why are they paying so much. There are two reasons. One is that um, they need unicorns, you know, in the sense that this machine learning, this absolutely great machine learning engineer is good in linear algebra, good in probability theory, and good in data, and good in programming, and all that kind of thing, and they're such difficult people to find. The second thing is that they're not that many of um, initially, there was this notion that you can only hire PhDs for machine learning, which is not true anymore. Uh, there's a lot of boot camps have come up and people started doing it. But PhDs have the right mindset for doing it. They're not scared by reading papers with a lot of mathematical notations in it. And that's what most of the machine learning do. So, so I'm going to do questions. Uh, let's pause for some time and let me take some questions. Good. So actually, NLP is using a lot of deep learning nowadays. The original NLP was uh, based on parsing uh, English analysis. Yes. So there is a, that field itself is broken to now a lot of subfields. Uh, NLP is a natural language processing, but there is something called natural language understanding, which is needed for chatbots and uh, conversation user interfaces. There is something called natural language generation, given a certain amount of data in databases, how do you generate natural language sentences? Because when you are interacting with humans, so the way to recognize has become a machine learning application. The old generation of NLTK toolkits were just parsers and regex, you know, regular expression matchers. But now they are um, actually the API.ai that Google has and all. So the one I mentioned for the chatbot, like, you know, I want to fly to Bangalore, recognizing the intent. So there are different levels of parsing text. You have a syntax level, then you have a semantic level, you know, um, man killed a dog, dog killed a man, uh, in, in, you know, both possible, but one less probable than the other one. You know, man bit a dog, dog bit a man, that kind of stuff, right? So you want to make sense of this, so there's a, what is called a, he showed something like words since disambiguation. 
So there is a syntactic, there is a semantic, and there is something called pragmatics. And you need to apply for, and then slang comes in. Because now we are the WhatsApp generation, and all of us type only two letters for any word uh, nowadays. And so somebody needs to understand that, you know, B of N is by for now. Uh, that the, so there is a slang detection dictionary, so NLP is getting more complicated. They use machine learning. And the slang is different in each country. Um, each country, so that is a. Yeah. There are several, several of these opportunities. The best way to find out is to look at machine learning jobs. You can do an analysis. I'll promise to do that, and then I'll publish it. Um, uh, I'll share a couple of interesting side bits. But the most important thing is take any product, anybody who sells a product. Okay, when you walk into a shop to buy a dress shirt, a good salesman will offer you, sir, do you want to buy a tie with them? We have some nice matching ties. He associates um, buying a dress shirt with a tie, right? Um, this is a recommendation system by human beings. Now you are doing an online shopping. Like Amazon always says, if you buy this book, people who bought this book also bought this kind of thing. There are a couple of techniques called collaborative filtering and all that, but machine learning is used quite a bit for this. So these are called a whole class of things called recommendation systems. If you buy X, you should look at Y. Okay, that is one. Second thing is what is called prediction systems. So um, I work with uh, a, a company that recruits people. It's called Future Focus Infotech. And I run a small product group inside the company. Um, the biggest problem they have is that when they select a candidate um, that, and then do all the negotiations, everything, and finally on the day, joining kind of doesn't turn so if I can do a prediction on the probability of this candidate joining um, the company, a prediction system, or when I say there's a candidate coming in, we say, hey, we have to take a written test or a coding interview, the candidate doesn't turn up. So if I can find the probability of certain behavior based on the amount of data that I have, so prediction system, there's a whole class of prediction systems uh, that, are, you know, that are very popular, that are very important for doing it kind of stuff. And um, so uh, I did a meetup uh, in, on chatbots in Berlin on 11th. The, we were given a space by ThoughtWorks, and it had a limited seating, 70 seats. So we capped it 70. Okay. And 70 people registered. And I was ecstatic. I said, oh, this is happening like Thai Chennai. Then you know how many people turned up? Seven people. <laughs> and I said, this is not at all like tension. So, but the interesting thing is that then the, what I did was I told my wife, only seven people turn up. But we had a very good discussion. Because it's seven, we all sat. Because in Germany, we also got beer and all that sort of stuff. So, we all sat down and but deep questions. They stayed, they came half an hour earlier, stayed half an hour later, and then we had a large amount of discussion. So, I was very satisfied to know the number. I thought even if there is one, one member in the office. So, okay. So, um, then I, my wife said, what happened? Why, do you, why didn't you predict this? I said, how can I predict this? I don't know the country. I don't know the pattern of behavior and all that sort of stuff. Then we suddenly said, we didn't remind them on the last day, the day before. A lot of people didn't forget. Then I found that this meetup gives you data. So I went and downloaded the data in the spreadsheet. And there is this beautiful column of how many people signed up for a meetup and never attended a meetup. Okay, so if I use some of my data, it didn't require machine learning or data science, some simple data analysis, I would have known the probability of how many people turned up. So we would have bought 30 years, you know, and then took it all back to the office, for example. So, um, so prediction systems, lots of predictions. That is one thing that you can do. Weather prediction runs a lot, uh, this thing. A lot of simulations and modeling are done using this. Um, so what you do is the the opportunities are that if you really look at it, there is a do you have internet access? Yes. Uh, can sorry, our oh, Wi-Fi is there. Okay. So one thing there is a chart called machine intelligence. Uh, uh, can I just yeah. can you just type machine intelligence and you can say uh, Shivan S H I V O N. I'll bring up the chart. 
See, so there is something called CV Insights, uh, there is a magazine called Venture Beat. They map uh, various areas of uh, technology and now machine intelligence is, we have to another term, but it's somewhere in between data science and AI and all that. They talk about all the companies that are funding, being funded in this space. I'll give you one example. So there is a product called Grammarly, which I use uh, for correcting your punctuation, grammar and all that. I found that I make some embarrassing mistakes in punctuation. Um, that company runs it based on machine learning models. And they've been recently funded to the tune of $36 million, just a couple of weeks ago. And I would never have thought some grammar checking product would, you know, would uh, you know get so much of money, but it's I think it's a lot more than that. So what I the opportunities are uh, in several areas. One is that you watch the trending technologies, and then you take the problem that exists today that is not solved very well, and you can figure out how to. So there are three levels of opportunities, right? One level of opportunity is in recruitment and training. You build the skills, you deploy people, and you'll make a lot of money. But only certain people can do that, right? The next level of opportunities, go and build core technologies, which is a little bit difficult for us in India because we are not trained to be very distinct, but grab a bunch of PhDs in any, any industry, like any discipline. Physics, actually a lot of physics PhDs are in machine learning, right? Uh, yeah, Shivan, SHIV1. Space machine intelligence. Yeah, landscape. Yeah. The current state of the second one. This three point Yeah. So the so that is deep deep into technology. That is the kind of jobs that you get to two hundred thousand dollars in the US. And we can't find. And the moment the moment you produce a person, will be taken up kind of thing. And a lot of companies are acquire hired for this. In fact, the co companies that are bought, like three, four people companies, that are doing some deep research, and each one is paid a couple of million dollars. Right? In Silicon Valley, the salaries range could be from six fifty thousand dollars to three or four million dollars for a single person. Right? This is the salary range because of the, the technology there. Then there is this class of things that are uh, application permission money. Which is the broader? If you take a pyramid, there will be the larger jobs. And if you take, there you don't have to be a machine learning expert. You can use any of the existing machine learning libraries. Uh, there is one called Scikit-Learn in Python, and there are a bunch of them in Mahout and Apache, and a whole bunch of them. And oh, there should be a diagram. Oh, I think it's two Oh, okay. So let it come. Okay. So these these are the different ones, and then uh, you can talk to me and send me an email, and I'll tell you a couple of other kinds of things. So how do you get these jobs? Is that because I, we are trying to do that in the group, but then we switch to chatbot, so we kind of like put it on hold. Is that you build a few um, sample applications in the area that you want to be known, and then give it away free, little much. And then you say, oh, that doesn't look like a great model. But what will happen is people want expertise. And nobody, even if you give it away free, people cannot take it and do anything with it. They'll start coming back to you. And the same model that Penta, Howell, and a whole bunch of other software companies use, you can do that. So whenever this magic appears, OK. So this lady, this is version 3. Every year in the past couple of years, she's been doing a bunch of technology stack, all the technologies that are associated with it. These are all, so go take a look at these companies. Uh, this is freely available. You can just go and type machine intelligence, uh, show and jealous, and you know, if you, now I think already publishes this information. And if you are really interested, I'll send you a couple of pointers. There's something called AI in various industries. Uh, these are all studies that they give it out free. You can take a look at them and then you get some ideas. Yeah, somebody else got a microphone. Here. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, this is telling about the credit card fraud detection. Has it been completely implemented with PayPal? And uh, my other question is, would that be possible to implement the same for internet banking? Yeah, I think I think that's a service that is provided. Uh, I mean, PayPal is, um, they also do a lot of uh, different other payment processing, right? They themselves are literally a, a payment processing kind of system. Um, I heard a talk by a person who said, they talk about the challenges in building machine learning systems in PayPal. Almost all systems start as hybrid systems. 
initially they do this thing and they tag the suspects and then some human being looks at it and then does it and then they go and include the rules and keep on. I don't know whether the uh, current system uh, you know, is uh, completely machine learning or the rule based or something like that because lots of times the rule based systems look like uh, to the outside. But this can be implemented for anybody, right? Because you, for example, I have a pattern of depositing checks, withdrawing money. I have a pattern of spending. Right? And that pattern over a few months, in somebody can look at it. And suddenly I go into a gold jewelry shop and start buying left and right gold, then they definitely know it's not me. Right? So um, you can look at all they have this pattern like several purchases made of several random products in several different locations kind of stuff. And so there are this, this is basically anomaly detection. We are detecting anomalies. This is not what the person usually does. And that is one way for, for you to find out. In retail shops like malls and all, we prefer to use credit cards. So would that be possible to apply the same detection? You won't be able to do it. No, the credit card company has yes, to Yes. The, is that possible for them? It is. I mean, they, a lot of them do. Because you know what? If you claim fraud, they have to refund the money. That is the difference between debit cards and credit cards. You don't need debit cards, you have no protection. In credit cards, there is a protection, right? They are supposed to, within, you notice it, you inform them, they're supposed to. That's why they spend so much money on fraud detection because any money that they don't have to pay, and then they start tracking the fingerprints of this, you know, thieves. They're all actually a bunch of, they're like professional credit card thieves, right? And, uh, you know, there are certain interesting patterns there. Uh, you know, the market, black market, there are million credit cards available for sale and all that, and these are like, Poorly has used it been implemented? It is, many of them have implemented. Visa has it, for example. Citibank, a lot of these, they do. They are all worth it because otherwise they use ton of money. They lose a lot of, lot of money. Yeah, okay. They, they are fancy till you get to know them, right? So I think it's very simple. What language do you put on your developer? What language do you put on your Kind of scholar? No, not function. Huh? Okay. So, machine learning is independent of language. But some languages have more libraries than others. The two most popular languages for machine learning are R and Python. Okay. And if you know any kind of programming language from C to Java, it's very easy to learn Python. I won't say anything about R because R was built for statisticians. So, you have a slightly different mindset. You make a lot of assumptions. And I'm not a suggestion, so for me, Python was much easier. There is a library called Psychic Learn, SKLearn, which is the most popular uh, free open source one. So, what you do is you take a tutorial on machine learning. Uh, there are good courses in Udacity, Coursera, edX, MIT, OCW, all these things, all free courses. Take one. Uh, everybody starts with one famous lecture by Andron, uh, who worked as a chief scientist in Baidu, and now he's back. He's left. And uh, now I think he's, he is one of the founders of Coursera, for example. His famous lecture, um, first time I heard it, I didn't understand anything. You'll be here a couple of times, you'll understand it. There are lots of free books. So one of the, um, you know, I tweet them constantly. But recently, I think about a week ago, I tweeted all the resources available for data science. Free books, free libraries, free uh, videos, all those kinds of things, and you can take those books. But don't be, there is too much of information, so don't let that paralyze you. Start with something very simple. Find, come up with an application. If you can't think of an application, go to a site called Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, and they have all these competitions. And the Kaggle competitions, people have participated, and you know, um, like one of the prediction thing is, uh, the Titanic, when it sank, how many, what are, if you are X in Titanic, you are a woman or a kid or a, a male at the age of 40, you are in this deck or that deck, what is the probability of your survival? And that's a, Kaggle has very interesting problems like this. Um, so you can go and look at those problems, you can look at the solutions. This is a very practical way of learning. But the way you internalize it is to pick a problem that you can resonate with. Uh, because these are all kind of theoretical problems, but they own your skills. And then um, you implement it, and then, you know, there are boot camps, like a 20 week boot camps that get you jobs in Facebook and LinkedIn and all in the US. Uh, there's a company called Galvanize, and there's another company. 
um, springboard or something, and all these guys will tell you what is the, how do you structure the whole thing. Okay. So the different levels don't get confused. A lot of people say PhD, linear algebra, and that normally first chapter, if I read, I fall asleep. So, but there are other ways of getting started. Started with a simple applied ML, application of ML, and then you can do that. And then you will come to know about all the terms, supervised learning and supervised learning, all that. You will come to know when you practice it. Yeah? Python is more popular than Julia. Julia is designed for machine learning, right? Uh, and they make a lot of fun of Python because they are a compiled language. Yeah, OK. So you can probably share the experience with this. But by, if you are looking for skills and jobs, uh, there is a lot more requests for Python. You know, the reason is, I don't know about Julia, so I'm not going to talk about it. But one of the interesting things about Python is, started as a scripting language. Now, you know, like YouTube is built in Python. Dropbox is built in Python. Cora is built in Python. So large web applications, highly scalable web applications are uh, built in Python. But the interesting thing about it is, is throwaway code. You can very quickly build an application, very quickly throw it, um, use it, and then you can throw it away or you can improve it and all that. So the cost of experimentation is very low. I don't know about it. If Julia is like that, then maybe Julia is the one. But you, yeah, but you'll find a lot more Python programmers. But you're willing to start from scratch and you'll learn on your own, then you Actually, surprisingly, if you look at this list, a lot of them are small companies. And what is happening is this. There are three trends that are making this happen. One is large amount of publicly available data, number one. Number two, large amount of data that comes from your own website. Okay. So, and there are techniques previously that used to work only with very large data, but now there are a whole bunch of techniques. So somebody came and asked this question, hey, my child doesn't require a million rows of data to learn to recognize a ball. Why does this damn machine require a million rows to recognize a ball, for example? And um, so there is this whole uh, area where people are trying to say, can you work with small data and can you recognize this kind of thing? So what you have to do for a small business is you need to find the benefits of applying machine learning for certain kind of problems. It's not for everything. If you're going to write a payroll system, I won't say use machine learning. So there's a whole class of things which are completely useless. Uh, machine learning is not the right thing to do. But things like conversion predictor. So if I'm a small website, I want to say how many of my visitors convert. And that's a common problem that I can use prediction to this. So many of the regressions. Like one of the examples that people normally give is um, size of the house and the price of the house, and you have all these prices. Can you go and, given the size of the house, can you predict the price? That's a very simple model with only two variables. But now, location. Houses in Mylapur cost different from houses in Nadeyar, which cost different from houses in Banjara Hills and Hyderabad. So there is a location, you add a parameter. Then you add a parameter about the air quality. Then you add a parameter about the schools. Availability. Now we start adding more and more of these parameters, your model becomes more complex. So how do you predict the price of a house? Take a simple thing. And that's not necessarily a large company problem. So there are many small company problems that can be solved um, using technologies, but not every one of the conventional problems. So these are problems that are not easy to solve by people by writing a set of rules. Yeah. Is there any uh, standard uh, Maybe I can measure how accurate the prediction system is. Is there any scientific yeah, human experience other than the actual user experience? Yeah, so th th that's a good question. Is that when we did it, we didn't know. So there are these things called precision and recall. Uh, so there are metrics for you to measure, and in many of these systems will also give you a score of prediction accuracy for doing it. It improves with data, so that is, that is one important thing. But the most important thing is people know one technique does it well. Like we don't know this video you saw, no? We, with a smaller amount of data, one, one particular technique was better with a larger amount of data. So what happens is they use this method called ensemble method, where what they do is they take 10 different algorithms which are very popular, and then they apply the algorithms and see the results, and then do a mixture of algorithms, then they go to different algorithms based on what they require. So that is one. So I didn't cover one part of it, so let me, uh, uh, it's a slight diversion. Uh, not to answer to your question. The way they train the machine learning algorithms is like this. 
they take the data. Let's say I have 10,000 rows of data. So one simple method is I can slice it into two halves and say, you know, 5,000 rows of data. I train the algorithm. So the algorithm produces an equation or a model or a program, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the term model is used very frequently, but it's a big mathematical equation. What does it exactly do? What it does is it keeps on abstracting to higher levels so that the dependencies on those variables is removed, kind of thing. It comes up with an abstract model. Now, how do you know this model is good? So you test it with the testing data. So the other, so normally it's split is 70, 30, or 50, 50. But now there are smarter algorithms that say, okay, I have 10,000 rows of data. I'm going to do a slice. I'm going to use 90% of training, 10% of testing. And I'm going to keep on sliding. Like I'm going to do the first with 90%, then 10%, then I'll do the you know, uh, second 90%, roll it down. And so they use these techniques. And so that's one of the reasons why I think machine learning is also designed to give hardware to a lot of money. I think. The GPUs are used very heavily because they do a lot of floating point calculations. And at the core, the underlying technology is all matrix multiplication, you know, you know, reduction, comparison, and all. The matrix are different. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, is it that? I can't hear. It does that so work? The first is about text summarization. Yeah. So Okay, I don't know the direct answer to that, but there are a bunch of open source projects on text summarization. And there's a bunch of papers. Text summarization is hard for two or three reasons. But look at some associated uh, papers like what is called topic modeling. So the, there is um, there is an area called NDA it's called latent uh, association. Um, it came from latent semantic analysis portion. So essentially, what they do is all these buzzwords they take off. Basically, what it does, it takes documents, okay, and then says, hey, from which document this information came? Well, given a bunch of documents, it can analyze the topics and it can say that typically this topic contains these words. So it can come up with this topic. So that is the starting point. Then there's a whole bunch of techniques. So the summarization part is difficult because what is the angle you're looking at? Let's say that I'm picking a story on uh, abuse of social media, right? I can build three, four different summaries out of this, right? One summary could be how bad a certain social media company is, or how bad the behavior of males in the social media, or how bad is the spam in social media and fake news in social media. There are all these different angles. Right now, I've not seen anything that gives the context for the angle, and I think Google does it in a slightly different way. So if I have to write from scratch, I would use this technique. I'll go to a bunch of science, scientific papers and I'll look at the abstracts and the paper. Abstract is a text summarization of your paper. Learn from it using a model like this and build, build on top of it. Also, do you know any good resources for feature engineering? Okay, so with deep learning, feature engineering has gone off. Um, uh, I can send me an email and I'll send you something. Yeah, but machine learning is uh, mathematics and algorithms. Correct. As an application developer, to start with, are there any frameworks or toolkits which simplify without going deep into algorithms? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The psychic learn, you don't have to know any mathematics. You don't, the underlying things are all completely abstracted. You just make a call. In fact, there is a, uh, in my slide, there is a six lines of Python code. For classifying apples and oranges. If you guys want to see it, I can run that video. It's like maybe a three minute video kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, it's it's an amazing thing because it's, there is a series on machine learning. Um, there are like three minute videos and four minute videos. They show it to you. And you don't have to know anything uh, at that level. Uh, recently watched a movie called The Sub. Okay. And uh, the narration is very good. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you know that one pilot with 40 years of experience has landed the plane in Hudson River in New York. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in that, basically, there's a lot of investigation happens whether is it a human error. Okay. So, when they dig, actually dig, okay, they make simulations. And simulation shows they would have reached the airport 
within the given timeline. Then the key thing the pilot says the human element was missing. Okay, then they said okay, 30 seconds is a response time for you, which as instance has never occurred. So when we talk about all this machine learning and AI, are we considering this human element? And a lot of English movies have come in this regard. And this is actually a real case. Okay, the ACRS data, whatever has been pulled, is proven wrong. His sense of timing has saved 155 lives. So, are we considering this human elements or emotions anywhere in the whole bunch? We are. Actually, in fact, many of the, uh, the biggest problem with the machines is that they don't have the same level of context. But think about this. So, most of the planes run on autopilots, right? But both takeoff and landing, humans watch it very, very carefully, right? So, I think there is this hybrid systems. In fact, almost a lot of machine learning systems, there is, there is this term called human in the loop. So they bring in human in the loop, but there is one problem, right? Uh, what is 35 into 27? So let me do this. This is like kind of interesting one. So I'm going to just shout out some numbers. I'm going to cheat you. And I'm going to you are going to tell me how I'm cheating you. So 35 into 25 is 875, okay? 82 into 78 is 6,396, okay? I'm not doing mental math. I'm not actually multiplying it. I'm actually cheating you, right? The reason why I can give you some more patterns, and I normally do this exercise to get the attention of students because they sit in the lecture hall and they don't want to listen. So something like this makes them all like sit up and take notice kind of stuff, right? There are abilities that we have we are losing because we have calculators to do that work right now. And my biggest worry is that as these kinds of tools progress, some of the intuitive stuff that something is wrong is going to be missing from us, right? Uh, that Hudson River thing is pretty interesting. I followed it because um, somebody was tweeting as they were walking out. They were asked to walk out, and one guy go to the right wing, one guy go to the left wing. So they didn't want it to tilt because the water was freezing. They would have all died. So they wanted to keep the balance floating. And some dude was actually as we were walking out, he was tweeting about it. And that is like a, an interesting story by itself. Uh, but humans, I think for a long time, this is what is going to happen. We're going to get more data from these to make better decisions. That's my hope. I don't believe in this bogus thing about machine learning taking over, you know, or AI taking over humans. and will all be useless and all this sort of because our faculties can you know improve too right as, as things are going on but there is you know almost all these technologies are being used there is a concept of human in the loop but what can you do with a billion rows of data somebody can reduce it and when you five points then you can make a decision uh, using that so there is there is no automated way of landing aircraft in the airports right there are still human beings there deciding which one should go to which runway and all that I don't think humans can be able to. But that's that's my bias. So. Can you show the apple orange classifier? Apple orange classifier. I, I have sure. Yeah. yeah. I have uh, one question. Sure. So, when it comes to application of machine learning, people are still can use internet. One of the recent examples is Halifax being acquired by Google itself. So how do you see machine learning impacting all the users? who are up into this internet era. India is right now 400 million users for the 1.3 billion population. So how can machine learning be used? And really off topic question would be, you spoke about Tesla and I believe I came across a news where Tesla was not able to come out of white drink powder. So white salt powder, it, they told it was pretty much like, you know, supernatural thing. So you are talking about that. Yeah, there are always be a lot of cases that can fool human beings also. So which error is? So going back to your question, I don't think I can, I really know how to answer that because um, it, there may not be direct uses of machine learning. Because like you said, many of the current applications on internet shopping and all that sort of stuff. Uh, our next topic next month is going to be Internet of Things. Think about smart cities. Think about automatic energy management. Think about 
automatic water leak detection and shutting up. You think about tons of common uses that these kind of algorithms can do that are invisible under the infrastructure. And my I mean, very rough uh, guess answer is that those are the ones that are going to uh, really help. And then they'll disappear. So when machine learning or any of these technologies get really good, does everybody talk about electricity as a technology today? We don't, right? Do we talk about roads as technology? We don't. They just disappear into the uh, infrastructure. <coughs> that is that's what will happen. You won't even know that you are dealing with AI and machine learning. They get really good. But we are a couple of decades away from that kind of usage. Yeah. Okay, last question. question. Okay, last question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you refer to AI platforms, right? There are various AI platforms in terms of open source as well as proprietary kind of, uh, for example, AP.AI or core, mind builders kind of proprietary. How do you see it evolving? Because as you said, it's a black box in terms of latency issues, a lot of things could be there, right? So how do you see, which type of solution do you see evolving more? So we, we went through, that's a, that's a really good question. So we went through, a, when we were building a chatbot, we went through Microsoft Lewis, where we didn't know it was a black box approach. Then we went to API.ai, which was bought by Google, which is another black box approach. And then we recently found a company in Berlin called Rasa.ai, which completely open source uh, the AI engine. So there is an effort in US. So there is this, you know, there are a lot of interesting things happening. There's a bunch of people like Bill Gates, um, like Elon Musk, all of them think AI is going to be dangerous. It's going to take us to places where we can't easily come back and it's going to destroy us. One theory. And probably true. So what they did was they formed this company called OpenAI. You can go and Google it. OpenAI publishes all the algorithms, or everything they, all the research they do, they make it completely available. That is one part. There is a second part. A lot of, you know, uh, leadership in this field depends on how much data you have. Google has tons of data because we give it to them. We search, we do mobile thing, we drive around, we use Google everywhere. Uh, we do email, Google has all the data. They will not be individually peeking into your email. They don't know to know human being has the time to do it, but they have tons of data. Facebook has tons of data because we give it to them. Twitter has tons of data because we give it to them. What about a new company that comes into the field that does not have access to all this data? So there is a whole bunch of open data initiatives that make this data available uh, to people to go and use it. So there are two directions, open data and open AI are two areas where you can you can look at it and then you can figure out. Okay? Alright. So how uh, video time and okay. Three minutes. Three minutes. So why don't I just email it to you? Uh, who yeah. I want it. Um, I'll send it because I think one is that it's on my machine. Uh, so it's a series actually. It's a really good series. And um, yeah. there are two I'll send you to. What I'll do is, uh, what is the best way to, yeah, I'll send it to you and you can yeah, uh, so forward the for video you a page. Why don't you just upload it to a Dropbox folder or, and this is will be done. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, and uh, just uh, three quick updates to end the day. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to Richard for this wonderful session. It was a On the three quick updates from Tai uh, Tomorrow we are having a GST book launch, uh, especially in Tamil, by uh, the president of uh, Tai Coimbatore, Mr. G. Karthik. It's happening in Music Academy. Uh, everybody is welcome there. And uh, the next announcement is uh, on 29th of this month, we are having uh, the Lufthansa Runway to Success. It's basically a one day crash course uh, for entrepreneurs to understand what startup is and you know, from A to Z of what uh, an entrepreneur should do in order to have a successful startup. The third and the most important announcement is that uh, Tai Chennai has uh, come up with the annual uh, member retreat, uh, which is happening on 31st August. And uh, we'll be going to Kodaikanal. Uh, we're having about uh, close to 16 investors with us, and a lot of charter members are also joining us. So the mailers for all these uh, events have been sent out to you. Please uh, feel free in case you have any queries. Thank you. And uh, you can reach Mr. Dore at uh, the following details.